So you've heard it said that you can't judge a book by its cover, and that is true. It is also true that you can judge a cover by the book. That is, judge the cover by the story or the information that is contained within the front and back of that publication. I've done this more than once in my life. I've bought novels that are considered classics. They might be getting to be older, and so you can get them for pretty you know, low prices. And then they arrive, and like they're kind of lame, like the covers are kind of cheap, and they don't look that good. And you go, well, it's okay, like because maybe I won't even like this book. And so sometimes I read them, and I go, yeah, that's forgettable. And other times I go, man, that is, that is such a good story that I'm going to buy a better copy of this now. And so I'll buy one that has a hardcover, for example, so it can last hopefully my lifetime, or I'll buy one where the cover art feels worthy of the story that it is enclosing. Now sometimes, and you may have found this, that Sabbath is judged by the cover that gets put on it. It's often the case that with Sabbath, we judge the Sabbath by a lousy cover rather than looking to the story or the plot line, the heart of what the Sabbath actually is. And when we judge the Sabbath by the cover, then we never really give it a chance. And so today I want to talk about the most common cover that I think the Sabbath is veiled behind, and that is legalism. Uh, we've talked a lot about busyness the last two weeks and the challenge that busyness is to Sabbath. Today we're going to look at legalism as a deterrent from Sabbath. Uh, busyness would be a distraction. Legalism is a deterrent. Uh, it, it offers this horrible cover, we could say, similar to like a horrible cover stretched across a good story but sitting under fluorescent lights in an airport gift shop. An amazing story, but yet uninteresting to a weary traveler with all kinds of time to kill. And so this morning I want to consider some of the problems that are legalism as it pertains to Sabbath. I think some of these are true of legalism across all expressions and all contexts, but specifically for Sabbath today. And then alternatively, of course, why Jesus offers a much better cover, a cover that accurately conveys the plot line and God's heart for Sabbath. Um, my intention in this series was to go the beginning, the Old Testament, the Gospels, then the Epistles, and then we're going to wrap it up on week five with sort of some practical, a helpful guide to do Sabbath in your own home, that kind of thing, all right? So this is our Gospel week. Luke 6, 1 to 11 will be our text. We're going to read just the first five verses, and then we'll pick up with the following verses after that. So beginning 1 to 5, Luke chapter 6. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So contained in these five verses is, the, is one of the accounts of the disciples doing something on Sabbath that upset the Pharisees. And then Jesus uses the offense of the Pharisees to teach about the Sabbath and to recover something that had been buried under a legalistic cover. Now the issue, of course, is the disciples are being judged by the Pharisees to be working on Sabbath because they are gathering grain and they are rolling it in their hands and they are popping the kernels in their mouth. And this, this action of rolling it out so that they could eat it was deemed by the Pharisees to be harvesting. And harvesting was considered to work. Therefore, they believed they were breaking 
the Sabbath law. And so the charge of the disciples, brought, of course, by the Pharisees, leads to an important question, a question that has troubled God's people for millennia. When it comes to Sabbath, what is considered work? We're going to talk about this question for a bit here. And then we're going to get into some of the specific sermon points in a couple minutes. But I want to hang out in this what is considered work and how have we gotten around this question. So what is considered work? Is making dinner work? Is walking the dog work? What about bathing the cat? Is that work? (laughs) Is hosting friends for a meal work? What about exercise? What about tending the garden? What about playing your instrument? What about going for a long hike where you may sweat? Is that work? And if you've ever tried to Sabbath, if you have ever tried to cease from work for 24 hours, I suspect you have asked some of these questions. And a major reason that we ask these questions is because God, in fact, doesn't really give specific Sabbath instructions. God gives broad and general prescriptions more than he gives very specific, this is work and this isn't work and blah, blah, blah. It's just general. In fact, there is only one account in the Old Testament where a Sabbath rule is broken. And that is found in Exodus 15. And the problem is a man gathers wood on the Sabbath. And the penalty is severe. He dies. (laughs) because of breaking God's law, which is a whole other sermon in itself on the consequence of working all the time. But jumping to the time of Jesus, we find then that these Pharisees believe there are many answers to the age-old question, what constitutes work on the Sabbath? Now remember, the Pharisees, these guys love rules. They love black and white living. They despise gray areas. They do not like anything that is bendable or subjective rather than being rigid and objective. They don't want general prescriptions. They want crisp commands. They don't want to think about every Sabbath action every single Sabbath. They just want to know what is right and what is wrong, and then they will follow the rules. They were convinced that there was only one right way to do everything. And they were the ones that knew all the right ways. Now, I confess that there is a Pharisee in every single one of us, me included. But this rule-keeping lifestyle sounds so lame to me. Like, these guys would have been awesome hall monitors and crossing guards. Characters who would have been common targets for wedgies, as children, I suspect. Uh... Forgive me if you were one of these. (laughs) I actually, I'm a failed crossing guard. Uh, I think in grade two or three I was a crossing guard, but I dropped out of the program, demanded too much of me. I suspect as adults, these Pharisees were common victims of heart attacks and nervous breakdowns. Because if it's black and white and there's a right way to do everything, that's going to demand a lot. But if we understand the history of the Pharisees, we can at least understand a little bit of their fear of ambiguity, even if it is still pretty nerdy. So John Mark Comer, who's been a great guide for this series, talks about the history of the Pharisees like this. They were born in the exile when Israel was in Babylon. Even when Israel came back home to Jerusalem, they were quickly conquered again. By Jesus' day, They were under Rome's oppressive rule. They were back in their land, but they were still in exile. And everybody knew they were in exile for breaking God's commandments. So the Pharisees' basic philosophy was this. If Torah breaking got us into this mess, then it stands to reason that Torah keeping will get us out of it. So they were OCD about the Torah. The Pharisees' conviction was that rules would be their redemption. So what did they do then? If rules are going to be our redemption, what should we do? This is what they did. They came up with some more rules. The more the rules, the better 
chance we have at redemption. And so they actually called this practice of making rules for the rules, building a fence around the Torah. Building a fence around the Torah. And it worked like this. If the command was don't break the Sabbath, then they would add more rules around that command as to prevent someone from accidentally breaking the Sabbath law because they would never get close enough to it to actually break it. It's sort of like driving on the highway. And you're going along at maybe 110 because you're all following the law. And then it suddenly changes to 80. And then shortly after that, it changes to 50. Well, the point isn't so much 80. 80 is just a rule before the rule. It's a limit before the limit so that when you get to 50, you're not going to break the law. Or at the Calgary Zoo, there is a fence around the gorillas. And then there's a bigger fence around that fence. So people like me don't decide to crawl in and join the troop, hoping to be accepted, perhaps as one of their own only to have them then turn on me and tear me limb from limb. So the extra fence protects me from the actual problem. I trust you are following. The fence building around the Torah, or rules about rules, then led to the establishment of 39 categories for work. Rules like how far you could walk on the Sabbath, or how much you could carry on the Sabbath, or what food could or could not be prepared on the Sabbath, etc., etc., etc. And so at the time of Jesus, stick with me, there are 613 commandments from the Torah. But then there's also an oral law, which is developed by rabbis over the centuries, and this is called the Mishnah. And within the Mishnah, there were an additional 1,500 commandments. So in case you're not following, that is a lot of rules. And so to bring this back to Jesus in our passage, when the Pharisees are accusing someone of breaking the law, they aren't even necessarily talking about breaking the Torah. They're talking about the laws around the Torah often. Laws from the Mishnah. And when they do this to Jesus, these rules hit the fan. And Jesus makes a much bigger statement on work and on Sabbath and ultimately teaches them and us why Sabbath actually is not black and white and why legalism misses God's intention for the Sabbath. And if we insist on reducing Sabbath to just not doing certain things, we miss it completely because Sabbath is not so black and white. And if you want it to be, it will never be what God intended it to be, what he created it to be, which is a place of rest and life. And so the question then is, if there is a better way, what is it? Well, it's mercy and freedom, which means that Sabbath cannot be reduced to technicalities. And so here we are again. Let's read it one more time. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Now remember, the Pharisees aren't trying to be difficult just because they like to be difficult. They believe that rules would be their redemption. And breaking those rules would lead to only bigger grief. They are trying to get out of the mess that they're in, not try to make a deeper hole for them. And not just for the individual, but the entire nation. Remember, Israel had a far more communal or corporate experience and understanding of sin and its consequence than we do. Because in our culture, everything is about the individual. Individual sin and individual salvation. We rarely consider what our sin may do to the whole group. But Israel did. Israel saw sin as a personal and communal problem. And so if some in the community continually sinned, it meant the whole community could suffer. And so to break the Sabbath then was to become like the pagans rather than God's people. And this had created horrible consequences in the past. So they're ultimately trying to protect Israel's sanctification lest we fall into deeper problems. 
Now, interestingly, Jesus doesn't defend his disciples here. He doesn't defend himself by arguing the fine points of Sabbath law. Instead, he goes on to cite an even more egregious violation of the law by Israel's great King David. Someone who was no doubt respected and honored. Someone who would be the, the, the one in who the Messiah would emerge from. And the violation that Jesus mentions is this eating the bread of the presence, or the consecrated bread. So this is bread that is prescribed in a certain manner, and it is meant for use only in the service of the temple, and it is to be eaten by no one other than the priests. And so King David's actions technically did break the law. But the need of David's men, because they're hungry, became more important than keeping the legal technicality for David. And no one blamed David for this. So what Jesus is saying is whether it is the Sabbath or not, human need always must come before legalism. Another way we can say this, the way Jesus said it in Matthew in the same story, is I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Which teaches us that when it comes to observing a 24-hour period of rest, we aren't trying to keep rules and technicalities perfectly. We are seeking to become strong and fed and energized and renewed and restored. And we are hoping, believing, seeking the same for those who our lives touch. And we are not seeking to be righteous by rules. Now, it's possible we could read what Jesus says here and go, oh, that's a relief. Sabbath isn't as rigid as it could seem. And yet, legalism continues to be the way that many followers of Jesus approach the Sabbath, or the reason that they reject it. So why does legalism remain? If Jesus is so clear on it, how does it remain, even amongst new covenant believers? I mean, maybe we could understand this about you know, practicing Jews today, we're still following the Mishnah and following the Torah. Maybe we get it in that instance. But for us, New Covenant believers, why does legalism remain? What is it about it that is so attractive to us? So Mark Buchanan in his book, The Rest of God, offers these two primary reasons why we find legalism attractive. First, legalism is mindless. And second, legalism feels good because it strokes our egos. mindless, and it feels good. Then he goes on to comment on both of these. So we're going to read two chunks of this section in his book. So speaking of legalism being mindless, the attraction of legalism is that despite all its complexity, it is mindless. It requires little or no personal engagement. It's sheer mechanics, simple arithmetic, no more difficult than cranking a hoist or measuring a length of board. You just follow orders. You match the parts to the diagram and apply pressure. It need draw nothing from your heart, your mind, your strength, your soul. It's like paint by numbers. It requires no artistry, no imagination, no discipline, just dumb, methodical obedience. Legalism is mindless. And legalism feels good. So he goes on. And the attraction of legalism is in its inherent rewards. Legalism feels good in a perverse sort of way. It strokes our egos, fills us with the pleasure of achievement, knowing we spelled all the words correctly and in such a nice, tidy script to boot. And it's even better if we accomplish this where others have failed. It's like winning a race. It wouldn't mean half as much indeed. It wouldn't mean anything if our triumph didn't imply others' losses. The secret impetus behind legalism is its competitiveness. The point is just to win, it's to beat everyone else. And this is where we get that goofy expression, they're good Christians. Like they somehow won the medal of righteousness. I'm not going to add too much to what Mark Buchanan says here, because this is just pretty easy to understand and straight ahead and challenging. But I'm going to reinforce the thoughts by adding, reminding, saying again, Sabbath has a lot of gray to it. And gray requires a lot of art, and it requires a lot of nuance. 
Sabbath is not math. And I'm so glad. It's not an equation. It is not a calculation. And for those of you that love that stuff, I'm about to break your hearts. Sabbath is much more like a poem. It is much more art than it is science and math. It's a rhythm. It's not a rule. And this is very good news because it means Sabbath has space. It is a space for us to grow and to try and to stumble and to get better without much consequence. Just like all other forms of art, we can get better at Sabbath. It's something we can grow in. We can develop at resting and become excellent at just as we can anything else. And I understand that for some of us, it may be scary to not have that specific Sabbath operation manual where we just go to page four, section two, and that's how we do it today. But there is comfort, even if that's scary, there is comfort in knowing that we don't have to be the arbitrator, the Pharisee, the judge of this because we do have a Lord who is over it. Jesus says in a very radical statement that he is Lord of the Sabbath, therefore we are not. He said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus doesn't stop teaching after his justification for the disciples. Remember wheat crunch? That's what I imagine the meeting here, wheat crunch. He adds another justification for it. And he says, hey, the Sabbath isn't Lord here, gang. I am. The Pharisees aren't Lord of this thing. I am. The Torah, the Mishnah, they are not the Lord of this thing. I am. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, it's easy to look at this and go, oh, good. Okay, Jesus is the boss. That's easy to remember. I don't have to think too hard about that. But this is a staggering claim. If you are one of these these leaders in Torah law, this is a staggering claim because God, Yahweh, the great I Am, is the one who instituted the Sabbath. And so to be the Lord of God's divine ordinance must suggest you have a very high place indeed. I am over Yahweh's ordinance. And he's saying essentially you can quit sounding that Sabbath siren, boys. I'm the Messiah and I've got this under control. And if David could override the law without much blame or consequence, if any, How much more could the much greater son of David do so? And not just for the disciples eating grain, but for all people who will forever need rest for both their bodies and their souls. You are not the king of God's system of rest. I am not the king of God's system of rest. Jesus is. And the grand benefit we can take from that today is we aren't required then to be the chief interpreters of every single Sabbath action for ourselves or everybody else. Jesus ultimately is. And what we find in his words and his actions is the assurance that Sabbath is meant to heal us, not afflict us. We carry on. Luke 6, beginning in 6. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all. (laughs) That's letting it simmer, right? And then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus, or as Matthew puts it, how they would kill him. Having just told the reader that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, Luke doubles down with another Sabbath story. A story about a time when Jesus healed in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And fun fact, 
Many of Jesus' healings took place on the Sabbath because the Sabbath is designed to be a healing thing. Now, the Jewish legal leaders, generally speaking, don't have a problem with healing if there was an imminent threat to life. And they interpreted that fairly liberally. I've never quoted the Mishnah before, but I'm going to quote the Mishnah for you. So the Mishnah actually says, whenever there is doubt whether life is in danger, this overrides the Sabbath. So they were, generally speaking, pretty cool about bringing relief and healing and help if there was imminent threat to life. But danger was key. If there's no danger, then they are adamant that healing would be work and it would break the Sabbath. And so this healing is a pretty big deal because there wasn't imminent danger. I mean, the guy's just attending synagogue. He's, he's not dying. He's not you know, choking. He's not on the verge of death. He's, he's got a, a disability. But there's no imminent danger. And yet Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, heals anyway. And in doing so, Jesus teaches and he demonstrates that Sabbath is not about freedom and he teaches legalism is burden. But Sabbath is about freedom. Now, I think that there is danger in reading these verses and concluding that the major takeaway is that rules should be done away with and a liberal attitude adopted towards Sabbath practice. And in some ways, that's true. But that's not really what Jesus is getting at here. What Jesus is teaching through his question and this miraculous healing is what the Pharisees have lost sight of, the point of Sabbath. They have completely forgotten the plot line of the story. That Sabbath is given because it is designed to bring life to God's people. They got so caught up in rules that they don't see the life part anymore. And if they hadn't lost sight of the plot line, they would see that the heart of the Sabbath is to bring freedom to people. And rules ultimately can't do that. Now, you remember Sabbath from the last two weeks, as we've talked about this, is to bring freedom from burden, freedom from tyranny, freedom from slavery, freedom by way of God's mercy. And if the Pharisees had remembered that, that story, that plot line, they would have come to see that this mercy and liberation are not just excusable on Sabbath, but they're actually obligatory. This is actually the heart of God. And today when I read the question of Jesus, which is lawful on the Sabbath? My gosh, how many Christians have asked that question over the years? Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? The answer is in the question ultimately. It's what Jesus is implying. And I can't help them but see the Sabbath as an invitation to both receive freedom but also to be someone who works for it in the life of others. Did he say work and Sabbath in the same sentence? You see, legalism will make Sabbath a monster, and it makes people its prey, and it devours. Serve me, serve me, serve me, serve me. Legalism makes the Sabbath a burden and a killjoy because it is always demanding that we serve it, that we give it what it needs, what it wants. Legalism makes Sabbath this thing that we must do perfectly rather than something that we get to do that might make something perfect or at least right in us. In fact, in Mark's account of the Sabbath, uh, this, this trip through the grain field, he records Jesus saying the Sabbath was a gift for people. Remember, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Legalism flips that script every time. It reverses the order. And it changes the plot line. Telling us that you are to serve Sabbath. But Jesus is saying, Sabbath is to serve you. It's your gift. So as Isaiah says, we talked about this last week, if you deem the Sabbath a delight, it will prove itself to be just that. But if you deem the Sabbath something unpleasant, something hard, something annoying, a dread, an inconvenience. It will certainly be that. Now we're going to land this plane with a fairly long application. So here's the sermon in in a sentence. I promised I was going to start doing this. 
which scares me a little bit because it means you don't have to listen at all until we get to this point. But that's okay. I'm mostly up here having a good time. So, The heart of Sabbath can't be found in legalism, but in looking to Jesus for freedom and rest where rules give way to mercy and liberation. Okay. Our final takeaway for anybody who still wants a rule, we'll toss you one. A Sabbath rule, you gain more by giving of yourself. And I would just add as a footnote to that, to others and to God. Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? So Jesus asks the Pharisees this great question. And then he heals. <laughs> and on that Sabbath, that man now receives a fuller life than he ever had before. And notably, Jesus' opponents, the lovers of the law, those convinced about redemption through rules, on that very same Sabbath, in that very same moment, begin to plot a way to murder Jesus. They all answer the question just in that moment. Which is lawful? To give life or to destroy it? Jesus heals the guy and they decide that they're going to take Jesus out. So who's following the Sabbath? And maybe that contrast is all we need to see what matters the most on Sabbath and what doesn't matter. Does it bring life or does it destroy? Both in our life and that's always the first question, well, what about me? But also in the life of others, our spouse, our children, our friends, our neighbors, our in-laws, colleagues, whoever it may be. Does it bring life to them or just me? Or more importantly, does it resemble Jesus? Does it look like Jesus on Sabbath? Remember, the original blueprint of Sabbath is to mimic God. He works, so we work. And he rests, and so we rest. And for new covenant believers, we still seek to mimic God in our day of rest. We just have a clearer picture, a perfect picture in Jesus. And so Jesus brought life on the Sabbath, and so we should seek to do the same. In her book, Keeping the Sabbath Holy, Marva J. Dawn says, the important point in all our imitation of God is its deliberate intentionality. We don't just think God's values are good. This church, oh man, I think if there is something that we tend to mess up, it is that, that because we acknowledge that it's right, that that's enough. Well, I know it's the right thing to do. But that's not what God asks of us. He doesn't just ask for like our approval. He asks for our participation. And so she says to do this fully, to wholly imitate God, we embrace what he does. And then she says to embrace is to accept with gusto, to live to the hilt, to choose with extra intentionality, and I like this last word, tenacity. That's how we imitate God, embracing it all, not just going, yeah, God, you're right. Go for it. When it comes to Sabbath, you see, you can keep perfect rules, and yet you can miss the Sabbath completely. Or you could take the words of Jesus seriously, embrace them wholly, and do something on Sabbath that Jesus would do, which is to bring life to yourself and particularly to others, even if that might be classified as work. And then be far closer in that moment to Sabbath rest than someone who lied in bed sipping mimosas all day watching soap operas. That's how I do Sabbath, by the way. <laughs> and then there's this other part of God, which is to give of yourself back to Him. To give your time, to give your attention, to give your gratitude, to give your delight. Yes, to give your worship, even to give your rest to God. So here are two intentionality filters, working off Marva Dawn here, intentionality filters you can use to assess your Sabbath activities. Because it's gray. Remember, it's a dance. This is a poem. This is art. 
So here are some very broad guidelines. If it's work, who is it for? If it's worship, who is it for? What is it for? Jesus said, do you remember this? This important thing Jesus said? The most important commandment was to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then remember that important part where he said that all of the law and all of the prophets hang on those two commands? So it seems reasonable then to ask, if I'm doing some kind of work on this day of rest, does that work express love for God or love for others? Because if it does, I'm nailing the law and prophets. But if it doesn't, if it's for me, I may be missing it. And that is a heart question, not an on-paper question. Because you can do the right thing on paper for the wrong reason, and that right thing becomes a wrong thing. For example, we might say, and here's some practical thoughts, I need to get that fence painted. But it's the Sabbath, it's, it's the day of rest, and I'm trying to do this better. But there's that fence. And my family will appreciate the clean and bright fence. So if I paint it, it would be for them after all. I should paint the fence. <laughs> but the truth is you don't know how to sit still. And you don't know when you will have this much time and this perfect weather again. So you paint the fence for yourself. And then on top of that, you find out that your family wouldn't care if the fence was painted today or 50 days from now. Or, alternatively, maybe that fence, getting it finished, that really, it, it will matter. Because maybe your kids can play safe. And your spouse has been so anxious to get that done. And you've already put it off so long. So this will actually bless them. And then it might just be a justifiable, justifiable Sabbath work project. I don't know. Or maybe, even better, maybe your neighbor or your friend. It's not even your yard anymore. Maybe your in-laws. Oh my gosh, not my in-laws. Maybe they need help with something. And maybe this would be the most generous Sabbath work Yet, it's not even for my fence. It's for somebody else's. But the point here is it's not the fence or any other task. It's about the heart. What is the heart doing with that work? I mean, Jesus wasn't just like, oh, it's the Lord's day, so I'm a craftsman. I'm going to put up a wall and I'm going to build a table all for the glory of God. He worked, but it's healing for others. Does the heart then seek to bless its own addiction to work and worry or does it seek to bring life? And then worship. Let's keep the same scenario. I need to paint that fence but I really want to Sabbath well today. I know. I'll paint the fence as an act of worship. Like if I say I'm going to go out there and I'm going to steward God's gift of this fence and my yard. And I will prayerfully express my gratitude over every board I paint. Then I could justify it as worship. And that might be true. No problem. But it also may just be a worship of work. A worship of your yard. A worship of your addiction to task. And stewardship and gratitude, that's just the cover. Maybe the best form of worship for you in that case, or for me in that case, would be to not do the fence at all. It's going to come down to the heart. Is it worship? And if so, for who? For what? Now, you may be hearing all this work for and worship of others, or whatever I'm trying to say, and God on Sabbath as our primary object and how we can lose that. But ultimately, those just still come down to black and white. What are the rules? But that misses the plot line. The Sabbath done with awkward intention will bring life because that's the heart of the Sabbath. Because that's what God, remember what he did to it? He blessed it. 
So there is something in this day that even in the most bumbling, awkward, dumb, stupid intention, God will do something that renews us because the heart is in it and the day is blessed to give life. It's not just a day off. It is a day set apart that is blessed to renew something in us. That is the plot line written by God. The day is to be a blessing, not a fairy tale blessing to those who participate perfectly. And I believe that day is supposed to be a blessing because I believe God. And Sabbath is so much more than keeping rules about what is or isn't allowed. Sabbath is about giving to God and it is about giving to others. It's about bringing life and it's about finding life. And this to me is so much more compelling than something I must do according to some law. This is about what I get to do because of love and mercy. So when it comes to Sabbath, you can look to legalism or you can look to Jesus, but the problem is you can't look to both. 